Good evening, uh, good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from. Welcome to the Case for Cities, our very our second session um, of this wonderful conversation series presented by the University of Cincinnati's School of Planning and um, the Mercantile Library. My name is Amy Hunter. I am the Literary Programs and Marketing Manager at the library. And on behalf of the library, thanks everyone for joining us. We have a huge crowd tonight. Um, a couple housekeeping items. If you have a question, please use the ask a question button. It's at the bottom center of your screen. We will get to those at the end of the presentations. And um, if you would like, please share with us where you're watching from in the chat. I'm speaking to you from my home outside of Cincinnati, Ohio. And we have, um, this is uh, I th one of our most international program that we've done. Um, so um, just very quickly, if you're not familiar with the library, um, take a look at our website, mercantilelibrary.com. We are a membership library in the heart of downtown Cincinnati. We've been around for 185 years and we'll be there much, much longer. Um, and right now, all of our programming is virtual. If you follow us here on our Crowdcast channel, you can find all sorts of great stuff um, that we've been doing this year and um, we've got some great stuff coming up. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Vikas Mehta and he will tell you about the rest of tonight's program. So thank you very much. Thank you, Amy. Hi everyone and welcome to our second conversation in the series that makes the case for cities. My name is Vikas Mehta and I'm a professor of urban design at the School of Planning at the University of Cincinnati. Uh, the case of cities conversations are produced by the School of Planning and are made possible by a very generous grant from the Hale Foundation. Uh, the online hosting, as Amy mentioned, is provided by the Mercantile Library of Cincinnati and additional support for a future publication about these conversations and an exhibition is going to be provided by North American Properties, the Western and Southern Financial Group, and the Orville Simpson Center for Urban Futures at DAP at the University of Cincinnati. Uh, in our first conversation last month, we talked about the potential of cities as places of choice and places of justice. And we focused on cities uh, providing networks that are only offered by urban life where innovation, uh, access to opportunities, a high quality of life, and diverse cultures can thrive. Over the next several months, our conversations with thought leaders, academics, professionals, community leaders, will bring new perspectives on how public space, health, transportation, housing, economic development, food, nature, culture, and philanthropy can make our cities just and desirable. Uh, with these conversations, we will showcase the immense value of cities to inspire and to find ways to advance and improve cities large and small, including Cincinnati and cities like it. In this time of the pandemic, I'm sure you witnessed the anti-urban sentiment in the media many who have very quickly pointed to the density of cities as the culprit have missed the point. In fact, quite the opposite. Looking at the world shows us that this is a problem not of density and cities, but of inequities and behavior. Inequities of resources and opportunity in our societies and behavior that is misguided by a lack of responsibility and leadership. Today's conversation, titled The Public City, is about public spaces as social and political places. As we all know, we are in the midst of two crises, one of public health and the other of social injustice. Uh, what is also in plain sight is the profound and undeniable connection between social injustice, public health, 
and public space. Once again, current events have raised any doubts of the importance of public space. Uh, in cities large and small, public spaces have been the savior in this time of the pandemic. All types of public spaces, streets, squares, parks, trails, uh, have provided us the place for active and passive recreation and social contact uh, that is so critical uh, to our well-being, especially in this time. Public spaces have also been the visible platform for civic solidarity and actions that are addressing the fundamental positions of citizenship, civil rights, racial inequities, community biases, and spatial injustices, and more. Tonight's, uh, tonight in this second conversation of the series, The Public City, we are joined with two leading thinkers on public space, Dr. Jeff Howe and Mr. Ken Green Greenberg. As all of our speakers in the series, they too deeply care for and believe in cities as a way toward an equitable, resilient, and prosperous future. They will talk about the role of public space and the public realm in cities today. Uh, during the second half of the evening, I will ask them about some challenges as well as opportunities regarding public space. Then we will open it up to the audience questions. Uh, and as Amy said, please post your questions with the ask a question feature in Crowdcast. Um, I encourage you to vote on the questions so we can decide on the ones uh, that we can take up to answer. And finally, at 9 p.m., we will leave you with new inspiration and appreciation for public space. Now I'd like to introduce Dr. Jeffrey Howe, Professor of Landscape Architecture and the Director of Urban Commons Lab at the University of Washington, Seattle. Yeah. Jeff's work focuses on public space, democracy, community design, and civic engagement. In a career that spans the Pacific, Jeff has worked with indigenous tribes, farmers, and fishers in Taiwan, neighborhood residents in Japan, villagers in China, and inner city immigrant youth and elders in North American cities on projects that range from conservation of wildlife habitats to design of urban open space. He has written extensively on the agency of citizens and communities in shaping the built environment. Dr. Howe is the editor, co-author, and co-editor of several books, uh, including Insurgent Public Space, Transcultural Cities, Design as Democracy, and City Unsilenced, Urban Resistance, and Public Space in the Age of Shrinking Democracy. Howe is the recipient of numerous awards in academic as well as civic organizations, including the 2019 SELA Award for Excellence in Research and the 2011 SELA Award for Excellence in Service Learning Education. The EDRA Great Places Book Awards in 2010, 2012, and 2018, and the Community Stewardship Award from the Washington chapter of American Society of Landscape Architects. For me, Jeff's work has contributed tremendously to our understanding of public space from the perspective of citizens and communities, and in many ways broadened our view of the way we see public space. Jeff is joining us today from Taipei. Uh, so good morning, Jeff, and welcome. Uh, good morning. Good morning, uh, because and uh, thank you so much for the invitation. Uh, let me go ahead and share uh, screen. Okay, is that working? Not yet, Jeff. I am going to try again. Oh, hold on a sec. Okay, there is we it go. working? All right. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you again, uh, because and uh, thank you to the Mercantile uh, Library for hosting this uh, really impressive uh, event. And uh, let me see. There you go. Okay. Um, so as Vikas uh, mentioned, I'm currently uh, based in Taipei. 
And uh, I have been here since uh, late June of this year. This is actually a picture that I took uh, the other day uh, in the metro station. Uh, Taipei has been uh, sort of an exceptional place this year. Uh, there has not been a locally acquired case of COVID-19 since early April, and uh, has no has been no lockdown uh, yet. Yeah, there's this is a metropolitan area with a population of seven million uh, people. It is uh, one of the densest places in the world, and it just goes to show, you know, that density is not an issue if people can you know take proper uh, precaution, uh, you know, during the pandemic, you know, like wearing mask. Uh, that people are, are doing in the uh, in the picture, uh, and if there's you know contact tracing, and you know this may be a tall order for uh, uh, folks in the U.S., but you know if there's universal healthcare, uh, not only in case you know people get sick, but it really creates infrastructure for doing all the work that are uh, necessary during the pandemic, and. Uh, earlier this year, I was actually in Seattle, and relative to many other cities in, in North America, Seattle is actually doing relatively well. Uh, nevertheless, uh, early in April, uh, within days, you know, all the place that, places that we have taken for granted, uh, libraries, schools, and you know, playground were closed one after another as the shelter-in-place order was issued. Uh, and you know, for places that were still open, you know, nothing was quite the same anymore as you we uh, all know too well. Uh, so, what is happening to public space, and what is going to happen to public space uh, if we can get through the pandemic uh, at all, has become an important question, uh, and one of the reasons that we're all here today. Uh, it turns out that public space, as because has alluded to, has been absolutely critical. Uh, during the pandemic, and I want to use my time here to just highlight a few uh, things that I have observed uh, over the last uh, few months on the role of public space during the pandemic and, and beyond. Uh, first, uh, public space has performed as a space of care. Uh, at the time when uh, self-help and mutual aid have become a critical ingredient for communities to cope with the challenges under the pandemic. Uh, in Seattle, uh, you know, back in uh, March and April, and still continuing, uh, almost as soon as the uh, lockdown was uh, uh, put in place, uh, the uh, community volunteers, including those in the Chinatown International District, uh, mobilized to coordinate uh, donations, supplies, and delivery of food uh, to our elderly uh, residents uh, who were not able to leave their apartment units. Uh, public space in this case functioned as a station area, as a space where uh, acts of care uh, can become visible and, and contagious. Also in Chinatown International District where uh, storefront windows were boarded up to protect against uh, racially motivated vandalism, artists and volunteers organized to pan the plywood panels uh, to make the community a welcoming place rather than a place of fear. Uh, hundreds of people, uh, you know, volunteers, artists, uh, parents and kids, uh, show up for uh, mural parties to support the local businesses. Uh, folks who may or may not be uh, members of the community, uh, you know, here a public space become a place of care and solidarity. Uh, and our neighborhood has never been so beautiful before, uh, with murals that, that tell the stories of the community, including people who live there now uh, and those who lived there before. And uh, because of the, the visibility uh, in public space, uh, this effort has since spread to other neighborhoods uh, in the city, uh, from downtown uh, to uh, places like Capitol Hill, uh, Ballard, uh, Georgetown. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic is not the first time that we have seen you know, public spaces functioning in this way. Back in uh, 2012, in the aftermath of Hurricane Sandy, uh, volunteers organized uh, relief efforts in public spaces among neighborhoods impacted by the storm, uh, including this paddle power cell phone charging station, uh, uh, meeting a, a critical need of the residents after the storm. Uh, there are many, many other uh, efforts, uh, not only after Sandy, uh, we 
the public space has uh, played a critical role as a space of relief uh, and care for uh, those in need and uh, also those who are capable of helping others. Uh, so this is one of the essential assets of the city that creates the condition of proximity, uh, which support our ability to help one another during crisis. Uh, so that's the uh, the first thing. Uh, uh, second, uh, public space is also a political space. Uh, in a democracy, public space is critical in our ability to exercise freedom of speech, uh, freedom of assembly, through which we as uh, citizens hold the government uh, accountable to you know, principles of equity and justice. Issues that have defined uh, year 2020 as much as COVID-19. Uh, who would have thought that during the height of the pandemic, a uh, you know, multitude of people would come out in such you know, great numbers to join marches and protests uh, uh, to express their anger and to support uh, the movements. Uh, in Seattle, as you may recall, uh, back in June, uh, those protests turned into an occupation uh, as the Seattle uh, police retreated from the scene uh, in Capitol Hill and uh, what uh, later became known as the Capitol Hill Occupy protests were chopped. Uh, but more than just taking up you know, spaces and uh, sleeping in tents, uh, the occupation was actually a chance for people to come together to uh, collectively reflect upon our commonality and differences, uh, to deepen the narrative of the movements through things uh, such as the street mural, uh, which has become a permanent uh, they mark uh, in the city uh, and through other acts of placemaking, uh, including the Chop Garden, a guerrilla garden made possible by uh, protesters and uh, volunteers during the Occupy uh, movements. A garden that functioned as a place for people, you know, protesters and non-protesters alike, uh, again, to come together to create uh, some positive energy during uh, a, a very tense uh, situation a garden that forged a connection between the movements and the issue of food and food justice uh, in the city, where uh, communities of colors are uh, overwhelmingly uh, food deserts uh, with little access to fresh food. A garden that also served uh, the needs of the unhoused population who live uh, in the park. Uh, a garden that helped center the identity of the black, indigenous, and people of color uh, in the movement. Uh, and even though the occupation has long uh, since uh, ceased, the garden, by having been planted in the public space, uh, inspired an ongoing conversation in Seattle about how to engage diverse stakeholders uh, in the planning and the design process of parks and open space in the city, uh, starting with Cal Anderson Park, where uh, the occupation took place. Uh, the group of volunteers, uh, led by Marcus Henderson, who started the garden, has since refocused their efforts to work with local farms and community organizations uh, to address issues of longstanding disparities uh, when it comes to food justice, uh, as well as local economic development in those communities. Uh, all of these uh, you know, made possible uh, through an engagement in public space, uh, the making of a guerrilla garden. Uh, the third dimension I wanted uh, to, to uh, bring attention to uh, is the importance of public space as a space of resilience in both kind of mental and physical sense. Uh, specifically, I'm, I'm talking about the importance of uh, uh, parks and open space, uh, which has been elevated uh, during the pandemic as we all realize that we need fresh air and place to walk and exercise for our mental and physical well-being. In Seattle, the city almost closed down our major parks, uh, uh, at least on weekends, for fear of large gatherings uh, during the outbreak. Uh, fortunately, there was enough pushback uh, from the citizens and citizen groups that uh, led the city to come up with alternative ways of managing uh, these uh, you know, park spaces by having you know, park uh, ambassadors that encourage people uh, you know, not to gather in large numbers and, and to kind of, you know, there's a sign there that says, you know, keep it moving uh, to, to, again, you know, prevent uh, the crowding uh, during, uh, it within the park. 
Our collective experience during the pandemic uh, reminds us of the importance of passing open space as a public amenity that require public investment. Uh, for too long, we have experienced underinvestments in our public infrastructure. Uh, that includes you know, parks, open space, and, and many other things that are important to uh, how city functions. Uh, many of the best known uh, examples of public parks today uh, are all results of public private partnership. Uh, Highline, uh, Millennium Park in Chicago, uh, you know, Broken Bridge Park, uh, again in New York City. Uh, these are all great open spaces, but the form of uh, public-private partnership, you know, which is not necessarily bad, but it has reinforced a dependence on private capital and private control and management, uh, and, and therefore creating additional sp uh, disparities uh, in our city. Disparities in terms of uh, you know, the, uh, the differences between uh, of investment between different neighborhoods, access to amenity, uh, engagement of the public and so forth. Uh, aside from these public, uh, large public amenities, we also need to invest uh, in our everyday environments, uh, nearby nature, uh, places that we can access on a regular basis, uh, which again, uh, as we all know too well, uh, became critical during the pandemic. Uh, community garden turned out to be a great asset uh, during the pandemic, uh, a great place to be outside uh, enjoy nature uh, and, and, and company of others uh, while maintaining physical distancing. Uh, we need this kind of green infrastructure uh, to save us from things uh, uh, such as climate change. Uh, even if the pandemic doesn't kill us, uh, climate change will probably uh, will. Uh, we need public spaces uh, to function as a green infrastructure, uh, a space of resilience uh, to increase our ability uh, to produce food locally, to uh, reduce carbon footprint, uh, to address you know, social economic disparities, uh, and so forth. Uh, so in summary, public space uh, is a critical component of our cities. Uh, for cities to be truly public, uh, for, for us to really talk about uh, this notion of the public city. Uh, we need our public space to play uh, at least these three roles, which are by no means uh, exclusive. Uh, obviously, there are many, many other issues. Uh, but I believe uh, uh, these three uh, at least serve as a good reminder and uh, perhaps a starting point uh, for more important work uh, to come. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Um, I'll do the the applause for the 377 people watching. Um, our second speaker tonight, Mr. Ken Greenberg, is an urban designer, teacher, writer, and former director of urban design and architecture for the city of Toronto and principal of Greenberg Consultants. For over four decades, Mr. Greenberg has played a pivotal role on public and private assignments in urban settings throughout North America and Europe, focusing on the rejuvenation of downtowns, waterfronts, neighborhoods, on-campus master planning, regional growth management, and new community planning. His work sits at the intersection of urban design, architecture, landscape, mobility, social and economic development. Um, cities as diverse as Toronto, Amsterdam, New York, Paris, Boston, St. Louis, Detroit, just to name a few, uh, have benefited from his advocacy and passion for restoring the vitality, relevance, and sustainability of the public realm uh, in, public, in urban life. In each city, with each project, his strategic consensus building approach has led to coordinated planning and a renewed focus on urban design. Ken is the recipient of the 2010 American Institute of Architects Thomas Jefferson Award for Public Design Excellence and the 2014 Sustainable Buildings Canada Lifetime Achievement Award. In 2020, Mr. Greenberg was selected as a member of the Order of Canada. 
For me, as a scholar and teacher of public space, I find Ken's work and writing to be exceptionally insightful and deeply rooted in the understanding of really complex urban issues that he presents very persuasively and elegantly. Ken, welcome. Thank you very much, Vikas. I'm going to share my screen or attempt to. Oh, just give me a moment here. Huh. Okay, here we go. Okay, can everyone see that all right? Um, I'm going to um, begin by talking about something that has really been the leitmotif of my entire professional career, which is this idea of expanding common ground, the ground that we share in cities. Uh, <clears throat> I'm going to relate this to um, the particular issue of Toronto, uh, the city where I live and where I have done the majority of my work. And Toronto has two really interesting characteristics. It has become the fastest growing city and city region in North America and simultaneously the most diverse. Over 50% of our population identifies as visible minorities and over 50% were born in another country. So you could say we actually do not have a majority population. Uh, I love this image because the people who worked in a distillery back in the 1930s who were largely um, Anglo-Saxon, white, as you see there, um, created this wonderful photograph lining themselves up against that brick wall. And the people who work there now in what has become a kind of center of arts and culture decided to recreate the photograph. And you can see in these two images how the society has changed. So I'm if I can interrupt for just a second. If you can change your screen perspective from portrait to landscape, um, we're we're only getting about two thirds of each slide. Uh, I'm not sure how I actually do that. Um, in the app. Okay, just uh, Ken, maybe you can uh, stop sharing and, and try to do it again. Okay, I'm just trying to see. Same thing. Can you go full screen on? I am that? full screen in terms of what I'm seeing. Okay. We still aren't seeing full screen. Hmm. Uh, can you advise me as to? Um, let's see. Um, um, I am not a PowerPoint expert. I apologize. I think, Ken, what we could do is what you have right now, if you zoom in a little bit, 
we would still be able to see the full slide, even if it's not going to go slide by slide. Let me. Um, Muhammad, thank you. Ken, if you could share the whole desktop for screen sharing, if that's an option. Thank you, Terry. Let, let me try something else. Uh, you see it now? Yes. Um, you see the full slide with the uh, with the sidebar, but I think that's fine. Let I think let's keep going. I think this is fine. Yeah, the images are pretty powerful, so that we can we can make sense. Okay. Let's try that. All right, so I let me just start again. Um, co expanding common ground has pretty much been the leitmotif of my entire career. And Jeff started really with what the pandemic has done. I'm going to start with what I was doing before the pandemic and then end up talking about the pandemic as a particle accelerator at the end of my talk. So the particularity of Toronto where I've been doing most of, of my work over the years, or much of my work, is this extraordinary combination of being the fastest growing city and city region in North America and the most diverse, with over 50% of the population identifying as visible minorities and 50% from other countries. And I, I think you heard me tell the story of the distillery. So I wrote a book recently, I came out in 2018, called Toronto Reborn. And the premise of the book is that these two things, the phenomenal growth and growing extraordinarily diverse at the same time, uh, was really causing the city to reinvent itself, to quite literally become a different kind of city. And at the heart of that is the sharing of public spaces, the fact that this extraordinarily diverse population with over 220 languages spoken and people from all over the world arriving here and making Toronto home has put an enormous premium on the sharing of public space. And so how do you make public space that works for this kind of population? And how do you create the places where people coming from so many different cultures, so many different parts of the world, actually get to know each other face to face, not through the windshields of cars and not on screens, but actually in real life, in public space. Traditionally, this happened in a lot of the older neighborhoods in the city, uh, which years ago were um, less expensive, obviously, new immigrants could move into these neighborhoods, set up their businesses, inhabit the neighborhoods, and this kind of informal gathering was happening throughout the city. Uh, but there has been a challenge to this recently. Uh, Canada and Toronto are not immune to some of the things that are going on around the world with um, a rise of tribalism and uh, intolerance and this is, this is a really interesting example from a city on the outskirts of Toronto called Brampton, where I've been doing a lot of work lately, where some years ago, uh, some white supremacists from Western Canada came to town. This is a city that has a large South Asian population. And they created this poster intended to frighten people where they took a riot that was happening um, in India uh, nothing to do with Canada. This was a, a demonstration uh, involving Sikh population. And what I loved was the high school students in Brampton recreated the poster. And to the answer of, is this really what you want? They put themselves on the poster under this rubric of unity and said, yes, this really is what we want. So there have been two major challenges that I've been dealing with uh, through my entire career. And one of them was posed by what happened in the immediate aftermath of World War II, which is the advent of the automobile, uh, the very familiar exodus from the city, the move to suburbia, the euphoria about suburbia and what it might deliver. 
And in the process, the um, unintended consequence of the loss of public space. So I actually began my earlier book, Walking Home, with a hypothetical walk from the city center going clockwise from the upper left here to portions of the city that were pre-war, which adapt themselves beautifully to 21st century life, to through uh, decades, the roads getting larger, uh, pedestrians feeling more and more isolated, buildings being pushed back from the curb to create strip malls, and eventually ending up in an environment where no human beings are really meant to be on foot. So that was the first big challenge. And I was dealing with the reaction to this, which is the advent of a new form of North American dream, replacing the one you see on the left, uh, which was really, uh, particularly for young people, being able to live in a neighborhood where people could walk to buy groceries, take transit to work, and very importantly, share public space in the way that had been possible in the pre-war city. A second big challenge I was dealing with was cyberspace versus real space. And this, of course, was uh, still in the period of uh, pre-pandemic. And so the retreat into cyber worlds uh, where we indeed might be in public, but we weren't there. And so the question is, um, what was that doing to us? And I, I love this quote from Michelle Obama, social media can do two things. It can bring us together or keep us isolated. A life looking into your phone is not a life, she said, you have to break out of your silo. And this is uh, what we typically see now in airports where when you go to sit down and you're waiting for your plane, you're immediately stuck in front of a screen which is bombarding you with advertisements, whether you like it or not. Um, this article in the New York Times pointed out that human contact had actually become a luxury good. And the political consequences of this, and this of course is a very important moment to be making this comment, has done quite devastating things to us. So on the left, you see the UK with Brexit and Remain, and the fact that you have these two parallel echo chambers or running side by side with virtually no communication between them. And on the right in the US, even more significantly, virtually no communication whatsoever between the red and the blue. And the fact that this lends itself to the propagation of truly dangerous outlandish conspiracy theories and so on, which, you know, this is clearly the moment to be thinking about that. So I'm gonna now describe one of the projects I've worked on, which is a kind of antidote to these two threats, the threat posed by uh, the automobile in the post-war decades and the threat of cyberspace, which is really the antidote, uh, the expanding common ground. And this is uh, a project I began some years ago uh, for something called the Bent Way, uh, Bent being the name engineers give to the combination of beams and columns that you see here, uh, transforming the space under an elevated highway running through the heart of the city into a public space. Um, so there you see it running through the heart of downtown. It was uh, one of the last and only freeways we built in Toronto. We stopped much more quickly than most American cities did. And I published an article um, back in 2011, imagining the space under this highway and the adjacent historic site as a kind of central park for a series of new neighborhoods, new vertical neighborhoods that were arising around it, reappropriating the space and creating a new civic space under the deck in the midst of these neighborhoods. Um, at the time, there were some 77,000 people who in a period of about 15 years had come to live in medium and high-rise developments surrounding uh, basically a 1.7 kilometer stretch of this elevated highway. There are now about 125,000. And so the idea was to provide a space that would connect all these neighborhoods and provide this great civic shared civic space. Um, this civic living room, and it's run by a nonprofit conservancy, 
uh, it's public space. Uh, we have on our board city councilors. Uh, we have a whole variety of uh, different community representatives. And these are the neighborhoods that surround it with these um, enormous populations, the 77 originally now grown to 125. And we've been able to do the most extraordinary programs here that bring people together. Uh, so this was uh, uh, something which you may have heard of, this uh, incredible moon feature, uh, day and night, which drew crowds. Our number one success has actually been a skating trail that weaves in and out of the columns under the gardener. Uh, we opened in January 2018 when it was 30 below Celsius. And on that first weekend, we got 30,000 people to come uh, over a three-day period and try on the skates. Uh, but so here's an image of that happening. But they're also just simple informal gatherings that take place. Um, things like this where people bring their lawn chairs and sit out in the space. And just to give you a sampling of the kind of programs that uh, run here, this is a dance production by a choreographer named Noemi La France uh, with a small number of professional dancers and dozens of uh, people from the community, including my wife who participated in this, who did a dance production over the entire 1.7 kilometers. Um, this is a contact uh, photography festival and we've made a point. This is uh, two things, one about the Filipino diaspora. Uh, one is about uh, an indigenous project of focusing on communities, giving them a space of representation um, that was not always available. This is a new monuments exhibit that we did in collaboration with New York, Chicago, Austin, and Houston. And this arose from the whole issue of statues um, celebrating uh, Confederate heroes and the whole discussion around what monuments would be, and a number of artists were invited to do their own interpretations of what new monuments for new cities might be about. This is Nuit Blanche, uh, an annual celebration where we all stay up all night. And again, local artists uh, and international artists were invited to participate. These were weekly communal tables, long tables where people actually shared food and where uh, very inexpensive meals uh, were prepared, some by famous chefs and some by uh, local community groups. For example, uh, a group of Syrian women who gave people an opportunity to sample food from their country and many different groups were invited uh, to provide the food. Uh, community incubation where local artists were given the opportunity to uh, use these as maker spaces and display their arts. Uh, working with the universities, this is the University of Toronto Faculty of Architecture and Design and giving their students the opportunity to create things in public space. And then simple everyday year-round recreation for the 125,000 people living in the neighborhoods. And then uh, annual uh, summer block parties and uh, weekend events. And so this has turned into an extraordinary success and projecting this forward, what is amazing is the kind of call and response. So again, pre-COVID, I had identified some 16 things that arose in public space in the surrounding local neighborhoods that would not have happened but for the Bentway. And now we're extending this even further taking over the whole corridor of the elevated highway across uh, about four kilometers of that stretch from one end of the city to the other with a whole variety of local collaborators in different neighborhoods. Um, and what this is really speaking to now is a whole different way of seeing the city, whereas our mental maps are not formed so much by highways and arterials, but by these green connected networks linking individual public spaces, but also ways of moving through the city. Um, I spent about 10 years working in St. Paul, Minnesota, and I've chosen this because it's a city of similar size to Cincinnati, 
three mayors, uh, Democrats and Republicans, hard to believe that that could happen uh, with a development framework. And I show this because the key idea, which you see in the lower middle image, is that every new existing and emerging neighborhood would have at its heart a public space. That was really, and the linkages between those public spaces really became the armature for the city. I mentioned Brampton, where um, in the auto-oriented suburbs, this same thing is happening. And we're currently working on a community hub, which you see in the lower image with school recreation center, library, daycare, incubator space, um, all of the attributes of public facilities in a pavilion, in a public park, in the middle of a 20 minute neighborhood, mixed income neighborhood, taking the place of what was a 60 acre shopping mall. So along comes COVID-19 and many of the things that Jeff talked about are happening. But one of the really interesting things is that the long struggles about active transportation have suddenly been given an extraordinary boost and very rapidly through the entire city as is happening cities all around the world, uh, the impetus to create a cycling infrastructure, allowing businesses to take over traffic lanes all over the city to extend that um, through the winter actually uh, and what's happening in the parks, and Jeff was showing examples of this, the parks becoming these great outdoor living rooms. This is a park that uh, my wife and I live on uh, for the last seven months. This is the scene every single day, and it continues into the fall uh, where people come out and occupy these spaces in ways that they had never done before. Um, and so the public spaces, I don't think we will ever retreat from this heightened use of public space and the innovations that people are making in the way they're using these spaces. So this, this is my final slide. And it really speaks to, uh, through this quote by Michael Sandel and this wonderful photograph by uh, Michael Marangoni, uh, to how this sense of res publica or common ground uh, really relates to um, our ability to maintain democracy. Democracies does not require perfect equality, but it does require that citizens share a common life. What matters is that people of different backgrounds and social positions encounter one another and bump up against one another in the course of ordinary life, because this is what teaches us to negotiate and abide our differences. And so the, the image below is kind of ironic because it is the antithesis here you see people in what is purportedly a public space, uh, essentially turning their backs to each other and in splendid isolation. And that's what we've been working to overcome. So that's it. Thank you for that. And I will stop sharing. And I hope you were able to uh, get a reasonable view of the images. Thank you, Ken. Again, I'll do the applause for, for the 379 people now. Um, so I'd like to start with a few questions, but before I do that, I just want to again remind the audience there is an ask a question um, box at the bottom of the Crowdcast um, screen that you are on. And so I encourage you to you know, ask questions as well as vote for any questions, not in the chat box, but in the ask a question box. So I'd like to start with a couple of questions. It's um, interesting that both of you touch on this idea of common or commons. Jeff, of course, uh, has a, uh, the urban commons lab. And you talked about the idea of justice as one of the three things that you see right now. And can you, you know, obviously touched on this idea of the urban commons. And that's been one of the central themes of your work. Um, so in making the case for cities, we want to emphasize that cities should be places of choice and places of justice. And regarding choice, um, I often tell my students that in this time, as um, Jeff showed a few slides around, capital has found public space, meaning public space is now one of the catalysts to create cities of choice. You know, that is really, really well uh, established and well delivered by, um, by capital. 
Regarding justice, as in cities across North America and the world, we have seen citizens take to the streets in Cincinnati, for example, to protest against social injustices. And that's a clear example of public space being used as a vehicle to demand justice. So my question is, how can public space itself be the space of choice and justice? And what are the ways that citizens can retain their claim on public space on an everyday basis? Uh, what can local governments do to make sure that public spaces retain their publicness in the broadest sense? And in looking at this and looking at the examples that you also showed us, is there then a need for an intentional, wide ranging typology of public spaces that actually works much more defensively as a commons? OK, uh, maybe I, I can start. And I, I start from the premise that's public, public space, and this is always been since I all the decades I've been working on this and every city I've worked in public space is a right it's a human right it's not a nice to have um, I think what's really interesting now from a public health standpoint is that we understand that public space from the standpoint of dealing with infectious disease chronic disease and climate change it really is the, the antidote to that triple threat, if you like, or it deals with all three of those things. And it also, and you know, I stress this in a society as diverse as Canadian society, Canadian urban society, it is the sine qua non for diverse populations to actually cohabit the city. So uh, that's, that's a very basic premise. And every plan I have ever worked on, the very first thing I look for in the plan is the definition of the commons. That, that is the foundational element of the plan. And you know the other things, the, the uses, the built form, the other attributes of the plan, it, rather than it being the residual when you've done everything else, that's the starting point. And it, the public space, I, I would say also is, you can't consider it only in itself, it's really at the heart of an ecosystem, a social ecosystem. So it depends on justice, if you like, in the neighborhood surrounding it, or in the city fabric surrounding it, uh, in order to be successful. And it, it raises, it raises all those issues of, uh, of equality, of inclusion, uh, of um, the space being available to all parts of society in, in a very profound way. Yeah, I think uh, in response to uh, because question, uh, what can public space itself uh, do uh, with support, you know, in, in kind of, you know a more vibrant democracy, uh, a more diverse uh, city life. I, I think what uh, uh, you know, the slides that I've shown uh, today uh, were meant to kind of remind people, you know, these are the things that could happen uh, in, in public space. Uh, but I think what has happened over the last uh, you know, century or over the last few, uh, decade is that the, the role of public space has really uh, diminished. Uh, it is something that, that has become you know, highly regulated um, and to a point that, that it is really stifle the engagement of people in, in kind of define for themselves uh, you know, their role in public space and what they can do uh, yeah, in public space. And, and uh, so I think we, we need to kind of rekindle that, that agency uh, again uh, you know, in public space. Um, but you know, at the same time, yeah, I, mean, I have worked with city staff uh, in, in many other cities, there's always a fear that if we just let people do whatever you know they want, you know, they, you know they turn into to chaos and then uh, things will get out of control. Um, and uh, so I think uh, so. It's always kind of a, a kind of push and pull. I, I, I think it's hard to kind of expect uh, the, the 
uh, the municipality to, to come up with ways. And they, I mean, this is not to say that that they're not, you know, you know, staff people that are really interested in doing creative things. But I think, uh, you know, some of these you know, energies really need to uh, come from the, uh, the civil society, the citizen groups that are you know, that willing to uh, uh, take an initiative um, you know, and, and to remind people you know, what uh, the, the the many possibilities that the public space uh, can, can function and, and can provide in support of a vibrant democracy. Can, can I just pick up on that theme of agency for a moment? Um, I have a, a friend, a photographer, who published a wonderful book about the Italian piazza. It's called Where Angels Come to Earth, and I, I highly recommend it. And he asked me to write a foreword for the book. And what I've observed in this period the last seven months is that Torontonians who were in, I would say, a somewhat regulated environment where the use of public space was kind of controlled, it was nice, but um, people are using public space in self-organized ways mm -hmm. and simply by sheer force of their numbers and not, not in the sense of a political occupation, but they're appropriating public space in ways that I have never seen before in all the years I've lived in Toronto. And the authorities are allowing that to happen because they don't have much choice, but people are also discovering, I would say, urban muscles they didn't know they had in terms of how they're actually sharing public spaces and taking them over and using them. And this is particularly important when you live in a dense city where people are living in smaller dwelling units, they're living vertically. Um, they don't have the kind of backyards that you would have in a suburban environment. They're raising children in the city. And so we're reviving something that we had earlier um, in, in a really, really interesting way. And I, I think this is a sea change. And we haven't talked so much about streets as public spaces, but we're also seeing around the world um, all the major cities in the world are reallocating the space in the rights of way of streets to active transportation, to walking, to cycling, to social life, and to entrepreneurs and to small businesses and um, people doing things in the way they had never done before. So I, I think this is one of the great collateral benefits of living through this pandemic. And as I said before, I don't see us going back from that. I think that's something which once you've experienced, you will not let go of. Yeah, excellent point, Ken. I think we've, we've seen this here in Cincinnati as well, that uh, the way people have been using these spaces that uh, have really not been programmed anymore or the programmed components of those spaces are inaccessible. And so then people essentially create their own ways to use those spaces to get out there and uh, not worry about the programming. And in fact, you know, the, the ability for children to be out and occupying the streets has been fascinating. That's what, you know, uh, streets were for children perhaps 50 years ago. Um, I've grown up in places like that. And there, it's very, very much a, a playground without having to go to a playground. It's only when the playgrounds had the yellow tape on them children had to figure out how to create playgrounds for themselves. So, you know, it's one of those necessities that has actually expanded our engagement and understanding with public space. Um, there's a question here that has some um, votes and it says, um, this is from Terry Grundy, who is a faculty um, and one of the people who's been really, really instrumental in putting this series. So thank you, Terry. The question is, how do we invest appropriately in creative democratic public spaces in an environment of tax resistance and tax avoidance, <laughs> particularly on the, on the part of those who actually have the ability to pay and make a difference? Mm -hmm. So I, I, you know, I, I think we have seen this so-called austerity agenda arrive pretty much everywhere. Um, 
and the, the diminishing of public life as a result. And, you know, Jeff brought up the point that in the breach, we've had all of these uh, instances where philanthropy or corporate sponsorship or other forms of paying for public space have stepped in. And I, I go back to my point about public space being a right. And the fact that we have to restore in the budgets of cities and do so to restore that funding, not only on the capital side, but also on the programming operation and maintenance side and do it throughout the city, not only in those few privileged areas that have the possibility of raising funds through alternative means. Um, and I, I think it's just incredibly important. Um, some years ago, and you know, for people in the planning and design world, this was a famous example when after uh, Franco in Spain, in Barcelona, uh, when the mayor Pascal Maragai took over, he appointed Oriol Boigas to be the city planner. And the first thing that Boigas did was to intervene throughout the entire city of Barcelona with these punctual interventions, which were plazas. They were public spaces distributed throughout the city in neighborhoods rich and poor as a way of speaking to a new kind of society, uh, a new set of priorities. Um, I'll just say quickly, I grew up in New York City in Brooklyn. And when I was a kid, every neighborhood in New York had its local park. And that's where I spent all my waking hours until it got dark and I had to go home. And those parks had great equipment. You could get everything from a basketball to a handball to a chess set and they had staff in those parks and people of all ages came and they frequented the parks. And that, that was in the same spirit as the Carnegie libraries, as when we invested in the New York City public school system. And we've pulled away from all those investments. And I think we absolutely have to make the case for public life in public space as an essential part of the budgets of cities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think taxation is actually one of the critical issues that we need to address. Uh, I, I understand that your know, tax aversion is a is a uh, is a concern, uh, and you know, but you know, when we are spending more money on prisons than education, you know, there's something wrong here, right? Uh, we need to look at the entire thing, uh, you know, the budget mm -hmm. taxation, uh, to figure out what are really the, the priority. Uh, that would benefit you know, our society as a whole. In, in Seattle, we actually decided you know, years ago to actually tax ourselves uh, you know, to create a, you know, a, uh, a better uh, uh, system of possible open space. Uh, and it actually doesn't take that much money. Each household, you know, we each pay an additional 80 uh, something dollars. Uh, and then we, you know, uh, in a period of uh, seven to eight years, you know, we created hundreds of new uh, open spaces. We have improved hundreds of uh, uh, new parts of open spaces. And uh, so I think once people re recognize, you know, the, the benefits of uh, investments, uh, I mean, I think that's what we should really call it. And uh, I think uh, yeah, maybe they'll think uh, differently about uh, you know, the way taxation uh, works. Um, another question that I had regarding, um, you know, and Ken, especially you've worked in so many cities, large and small, and, and Jeff, you have seen and written about uh, a lot of other places as well. In the case of Cincinnati, we are a city of about 300,000 people. Uh, we are, uh, for the size, uh, we are a very, very vibrant uh, city, as we talked about, you know, uh, rated number five in in parks by uh, the Trust for Public Land. We have a wonderful park system. Um, we have a very, very um, engaged uh, sort of uh, business community that is really interested in keeping the city active, creative. And it's one of those places that is has a far, far more cultural, creative ability for people to be in a city because it, they can afford to do all of that without being sort of uh, thrown out of the city. So what kind of decisions can cities like Cincinnati that have the energy, that have a population with the energy as well, 
uh, how can uh, what what um, uh, decisions can cities make to use public space to become better cities of choice and justice where these are not cities like new york or toronto where there is never an issue with the ability for people to occupy those spaces these are relatively smaller cities so that, i mean the, one of the reasons i showed st paul is st paul is about the same size as cincinnati um, when I started working there, St. Paul was hemorrhaging. It was losing jobs. It was losing population. Uh, the downtown was devastated. It was a sea of parking lots. Um, and the city came together uh, before I started working there. And I ended up working there through three political administrations. But they recognized that the Mississippi River which flows right through the city was this extraordinary public assets, and they had hardened the edges of the river, they'd removed all traces of nature for the barge fleet. Um, and so what became a vast collective project was rehabilitating the Mississippi River um, environmentally, creating a whole series of linked parks and linking every neighborhood following the watersheds to the Mississippi River, which speaks to another thing that's changing, which I think is really interesting uh, that cities like Cincinnati can do, is instead of thinking of public spaces as discrete individual pieces within an urban fabric, thinking of them as arteries and veins connected by um, all kinds of uh, linear connections. They can be uh, portions of streets, uh, they can be abandoned rail lines, they can be um, hydroelectric corridors. You know, I've worked on all of those so that the way we move around the city, and that was one of my slides, eventually you can move around the entire city comfortably in public space, not kind of hugging the edge of the curb to stay away from, fa from rapidly moving cars, but in comfort. And that does another thing where you have divisions among neighborhoods by class and by ethnicity, the ability to move through the city seamlessly. So I don't know if everybody's familiar with Ciclovia, which mm -hmm. started in Colombia, in Bogota, and now is all over the world. Sometimes it's called open streets. This is a fascinating phenomenon. Bogota, as like most Latin American cities, is incredibly divided by class. Um, and every Sunday, something like 120 kilometers of streets have no traffic. And people move through the entire city freely. And people go from the poorest neighborhoods to the richest neighborhoods. Not only are they walking, cycling, inline skating, all of those things, but there are also all kinds of pop-up recreational events that happen through the whole city. And it's an incredible icebreaker in terms of getting people, you know, as I was stressing in the case of Toronto, to actually know each other in a different way. Sharing space like sharing food is really the beginning of culture. And you know, the last thing I wanna say is, and this is why the Italian piazza is such an interesting example, is you have a powerful millennial culture of public space belonging to people in a very public way. I think we're, I'm just starting to see that happen in North America with COVID, that sense that this space belongs to us. Hmm. Yeah, I, I, uh, to, to go back to uh, because question, I think uh, there, there's a, a, a positive kind of feedback loop between public, you know, public space and civic culture, right? Uh, the two, you know, the one needs the other uh, to, to kind of sustain and thrive. And, 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 the, and, and the bridge uh, for that is a sense of ownership and a sense of engagement, right? So, uh, so you know, like you know, civic organization that really kind of take ownership of the, uh, you know, the public amenity, the public infrastructure uh, in the city and I, I think that engagement, obviously, is something that that you know, city of all sizes uh, needs to have. But I think there, there's one distinct advantage for a small city, a mid-sized city. I mean, Seattle is not big either. We're about 
uh, several hundred thousand, uh, maybe you know twice the size of uh, Cincinnati. Uh, and, and because of that, that, that less layering, bureaucratic kind of layering, uh, there is it's much easier to you know to go from the neighborhood to a city agency uh, and, and you know all the way to the mayor. Uh, and, there, and because of that, there's a kind of stronger sense of accountability uh, and stronger kind of civil culture that, that uh, came because of that. So I think that's kind of one adventure that mm -hmm. these cities have to really kind of foster that, that sense of engagement. Uh, and the other thing I would uh, also uh, highlight is uh, this importance of affordability. Uh, it has uh, so much uh, uh, impact on uh, diversity in uh, the city life, uh, and you know, like in, in places like Seattle, we're losing uh, our diversity uh, because uh, of the high uh, housing costs. Uh, people are not able to afford uh, living here. They're moving into a small city, uh, and uh, and because of that, I think, and that has the impact on civil culture and the public space as well. I think uh, that's another I think, advantage of a, a mid-sized city that mm -hmm. still. Uh, still has affordability. Because I want to go back to your question with, with another point. You were asking what, what cities like Cincinnati can do. And in addition to just having the space and having it beautifully designed and reasonably maintained, where you have a diverse population being intentional about the combination of unprogrammed times and hmm. programmed times. And I was trying to show you with the Bentway all those different ways in which we were inviting populations that didn't have what Hannah Arendt would call that space of representation to use the Bentway and make it available to them and give them the funding and give them the opportunity to be in that space and to come up with unusual combinations of things where people are not just doing what they're accustomed to with their group. So I'm just gonna give you one anecdote of one of my favorite examples. Uh, one of our most successful things is we invited a group of skateboarders, teenage skateboarders, to join forces with the art students from the Ontario College of Art and Design and the sculptors designed a kind of set of skating platforms collaborating with the skateboarders. And so the audience for that was as mixed as you could possibly imagine. Mm -hmm. And this connection of people who were otherwise disconnected. Um, the skating thing is really interesting too, because a lot of people come to Canada and they've never put on a pair of ice skates. So we actually had designers who came up with different devices everything from tiny kids to these beautifully designed sculptural hoops that people could use to walk around with skates the first time they got on skates. And so it became a place where people weren't embarrassed to come to the skating rink. And it was actually fun to see people trying on skates for the first time. So there's a kind of provocation by causing things to happen that would not happen otherwise. There's a curatorial aspect of that, which I think can be really interesting and can cause things to happen in public spaces. And, and also the affordability is extremely important. You, you have to have a low threshold. You have to have cheap eats. You have to have, uh, you know, things that just mean that everybody feels comfortable to be there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and thank you. Um, related to that, there's another question from Leah Holstein, who's also faculty at the School of Planning. Um, she asks, I'd like to hear your thoughts on, let's see, the questions keep jumping. So um, on the management of public spaces, including parks, by private or quasi-governmental organizations that have expectations about the use of the space, which are not congruent with their prior use by the local community. So as soon as you know these public-private partnerships occur, there are certain expectations that might not be congruent with the prior use by that local community. And so what, what are your thoughts or some stories that are success stories in that, in that context? 
So I, I'm going to make a case for the public-private partnerships, not as a permanent solution, but as a kind of transitional step. Because I think in the period when we had allowed public space to deteriorate so badly and in a sense downplayed it, one of the roles they're playing is demonstrating what's possible. Yeah. The quality of design, the quality of things that can happen, hopefully not as a substitute for public involvement in public space, but as uh, really an, uh, something to uh, give incentive to the public to get back into the game. Uh, we, the Bentway is part of something called the Highline Network. And Jeff, you showed the example of the Highline. And there are now 20 projects in the Highline Network. I think there are two in Canada and the rest are in the US. And the tremendous learning from that, starting with the Highline itself, is around that very issue that you're raising. Who is it for and who gets to decide? And I think in the in initial stages of the High Line, as wonderful as it is and was, um, the focus was on raising a tremendous amount of money to do this extraordinary space, which had ended up not by intention, but had ended up being a major tourist destination, almost to the point where local neighborhood people were not using it. And so there's been this pivot where the High Line now, Robert Hammond, who was one of the co-founders and the other people involved in the High Line, are making a tremendous effort in terms of outreach to the human shed, if I can put it that way, of local communities and getting their involvement. And I would say that's true. That is the number one topic of conversation when the High Line Network gets together, is what is the relationship between these spaces and the communities that they're serving, and how do you create an accountability uh, and an involvement? And we were very careful when we did the Bentway to this, we're on public territory, to structure that in a way that we ultimately are responsible to city council. Uh, we have a board that is broadly representative. We have community from the local neighborhoods. We have community advisors, and so, there, there is a very strong responsibility that goes with the use of public space to ensure its publicness and to ensure that the decisions about its use are made in a way which is, which is, dem which is as democratic as, as one can be. Now, having said that, you have to also be careful about the phenomenon of nimbyism. If you make it only the immediately local community in some cases that has control of a space and they get nervous about having outsiders there. So there's a careful, a careful balancing act, I think, involved with that responsibility. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think there is an important difference between uh, you know, collaboration and partnership and then this kind of more narrow model of you know, public private partnership in, in physical terms uh, in, as a way of kind of managing you know, our space, for example. Uh, so, you know, for example, in Seattle, we have a lot of civic organizations uh, working together uh, with each other, with the city government uh, in, in co-managing uh, the open space you know, parks. Uh, we have a, a, a volunteer group called uh, City Fruits that go around and harvest you know, fruit trees and, and mm -hmm. turn into you know, uh, uh, you know, like, uh, jams and you know, like juices and, and uh, uh, you know, and, uh, ciders and so forth, um, but the and, and these are actually key to the success of those spaces because they allow people to become engaged and become invested in the success of, of those places. Uh, I think what has become problematic uh, in this kind of narrow model of public private partnership is that we move itself from the broader public process by limiting accountability. Uh, and you know there are ways to fix it. As Ken had just mentioned, you could have community representation, you know, within these organizations, making sure that, that they are made accountable uh, you know, to, uh, you know, to, to to the community. But I think uh, you know it, it, I think there's, there's an important distinction that we need to be making between uh, the kind of broader collaboration and partnership that is actually healthy and necessary for the public citizens. 
uh, as opposed to this kind of narrow down version of what the type of function. Can I just touch on, on what is a very sensitive subject? I was really interested, Jeff, that you started with spaces of care. And I think one of the things we're seeing um, in cities now is that people are living in tents, they're living outdoors, they're living wherever they can live. And as the economy tanks, which it's doing, we probably will see more of that before yeah. the pandemic is over. And so I think these spaces have a now an added responsibility to adopt that stance of being places of care in many different ways and not you know immediately having a reaction of excluding people um, they really have to be part of the solution and deal with that very very sensitively and it, it's not this is not easy there are a lot of issues with um, people who have serious uh, mental health issues or addiction issues or so on and in the case of the bentway our team at the Bentway is now involving itself in this whole issue of dealing with homeless populations um, nearby and in the vicinity in ways that they never thought they would have to and teaming up with social service agencies and other providers uh, to do that. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think we have just a few minutes and Candidates, you have two uninterrupted minutes each, and I have a mute button. Just kidding. Uh, yeah, if you, I think if you just want to uh, say a couple things in closing, um, uh, this has been a wonderful conversation, but I'd like to at least give you, you know, a couple minutes just to for some closing thoughts. Well, I think what's you know wonderful about uh, public space and the, and the potential of public space is is, is open ended. Right. So uh, it, it's, it's, it's a place where, you know, a possibility, uh, possibility in terms of you know, our relationship with each other as, as citizens, our, our connection uh, and attachment to place, uh, and, and, and you know, places where you know, new ideas and uh, interaction uh, can emerge that, that kind of redefine our civil culture and, and, and the city. Uh, and, uh, but what has happened over, you know, you know you know, decades and years is that that kind of possibility has become uh, uh, kind of stifled. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, I think this is something that Ken has been mentioned before. I think, you know, what uh, has happened over the last few months, uh, and, and you know, unfortunately because of the uh, pandemic, but it also uh, kind of give us a sense of the possibility that that was not there uh, in terms of how people can and become kind of re-engaged with the public space uh, and, and, and develop that, that you know, sense of agency. And uh, so I think we need to you know, look at what is happening, has happened recently, uh, hopefully not just as a good, you know, like this, you know, come you know, and you know, something that go away once you know, things have come back, come back to normal, uh, but as a moment to kind of reflect upon the possibility of the public space and, and to learn from you know, what has been uh, able to accomplish what the public has been able to accomplish over the last few months and then using that as kind of foundation in moving forward. Okay, thank you. So the first thing I want to say is get out and vote. <laughs> <laughs> Not no, too late. Seriously, um, I, you know, with all the difficulty of living through this period, and God knows it is painful in so many ways, uh, both for us personally and then watching people who are suffering even more than we are uh, around the world. One of the joys of this period, and I'll, I'll make it very personal for my wife and I, is because we couldn't do anything else, we have been biking and walking the entire city every opportunity we have. We have discovered places we never knew existed and we have seen a kind of joyfulness, honestly, in the way people are doing things in public space and a sense of solidarity and cohesion in public spaces that is truly remarkable. So I'll, I'll give you an example. We live right next to one of those new communities that's by the Bentway 
It houses 18,000 people in high-rise buildings, largely. It's a mix. It's a mixed income neighborhood and it has at its heart a park and a new set of schools and a community center that's just opened um, this September. And we used to go through that park all the time and it was kind of nice and so on. But what goes on there now? And we go out of our way to walk through there every opportunity we get is um, it is the most incredible explosion of people of every category, every age, from kids who are learning to walk, kids who are learning to ride their bikes or skate, to people doing all manner of sports from martial arts to exercise, to pick up soccer, to basketball games, people out there sitting having picnics. Um, and at first we were wondering, it was so amazing to see all this happening in this one big space, whether anybody was organizing it. And so I made some inquiries. I thought, you know, maybe the parks department is somehow through the community center, getting involved and saying, you can be there and you can be there. And this, this is how you should use the space. And no, it was all self-organized. And, you know, so it goes back to, uh, and I have to go back to Jane Jacobs, who was our great friend and my mentor through almost all of my career, is this whole idea of self-organization, that given the right opportunities, that communities, societies, individuals, groups have, if we allow them, have this ability to do the most extraordinary things, things that we have often inhibited or not allowed to be possible. And I think we're just seeing this flowering of life in public space. And I, I hope it gives us the, the incentive, the inspiration to really uh, just take that to a whole new level after we live through COVID. Thank you, Ken and Jeff. Uh, it was wonderful to have you share your perspectives. I think this has been a wonderful discussion. We're finding new ways to discover public space um, and thank you viewers for joining us and for your questions. I apologize we could not address all of the questions. Um, we hope to see you back next month on November 18th when my colleague uh, Dr. Chris Offrey from the School of Planning will host the next conversation on the healthy city with thought leaders on that topic. Uh, be sure to check out all our other interesting conversations at www.thecaseforcities.org. Um, and in the meantime, I invite you to check out the conversations by the Urban Consulate that focuses on urban issues and opportunities, specifically racial, class, and gender equity. Uh, their next conversation on the election and the city, uh, very appropriately, will take place on Monday, November 9th at 7 p.m. And you can check them out uh, through the Mercantile Library or on their website, www.urbanconsulate.com. In closing, I'd like to thank my colleagues at the School of Planning at the University of Cincinnati, uh, the Mercantile Library, the Hale Foundation, and the Orville Simpson Center for Urban Futures for their support. Uh, I want to especially thank Amy Hunter, uh, who has been making sure our crowdcast experience has run smoothly. Um, finally, a recording for this conversation will be on the website soon. Thank you and goodbye until we see you on November 18th. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ken. Bye. Bye.